Welcome to another edition of Kavanaugh's Corner, the labor talk show in southern Maine on public access television. This evening's uh, show is really going to be uh, uh, two videotapes that we are very uh, pleased to be able to share with our viewers, uh, both of which are produced by a group called Labor Vision uh, in the Midwest. It's a coalition of union, uh, labor union people and supporters who are trying to get labor's story out to the general public through use of video. Uh, similar to what we do here on Kavanaugh's Corner. Uh, these folks are actually going out, taking rank and file workers out with video cameras to film their own activities and talk to their own members about issues of importance to working people. Uh, I'm joined as my co-host, uh, Roland Sampson. Welcome back, Roland. Thank you. Uh, Roland uh, recently returned from uh, Decatur, Illinois, and that's the uh, subject of tonight's videos. Uh, Decatur, Illinois is the scene of uh, some of the major uh, labor management battles going on in the United States right now. And uh, prominent among them is the case of the lockout of workers at the Staley Company in, uh, in Decatur. Uh, Roland, you were there. You want to just tell our viewers very briefly about the, the lockout at uh, Staley? Uh, the local is uh, now United Paperwork is International Local uh, 7837. Uh, they used to be uh, allied industrial workers, but the uh, both internationals merged a year ago. Uh, these folks were locked out by the company, which means that the company uh, is preventing them from coming to work mm -hmm. uh, back in June of 93. So they've been locked out right now uh, 18 months. Right. And we'll see this video, which will uh, describe in some detail uh, what the issues are, how this has happened. Uh, they are currently out of work, and one of the interesting connections to bear in mind when you're watching this uh, video is that, uh, uh, interestingly enough, not only is it the same uh, international union that represents mm -hmm. the workers at Staley in Decatur and represented the workers at J. Maine, where Roland's from, but also the uh, personnel guy who uh, was the personnel man at, uh, at uh, J. Maine is now also uh, appears as the personnel man for the company uh, the Staley Company in Decatur, Illinois. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that after this video. Uh, let's take a look right now at a film produced a year, two years ago, uh, called Deadly Corn, produced by Labor Vision. I was bagging up, coming out of the truck. I was gagging because I couldn't breathe. And, um, I found out that I had the wrong, the supervisor had given me the wrong respirator. So when I got off the truck, I pulled the respirator off because I was throwing up. And uh, the supervisor, he came over, over to me and uh, he said, Jeanette, he said, you know, we hired in around the same time and we had to die sometime. And the sad part about it, his lungs collapsed two weeks later. The A.E. Staley plant in Decatur, Illinois, processes corn into starches, syrups, and sweeteners. 800 workers there are represented by the Allied Industrial Workers Union. Since September 1992, they have engaged in a battle for their lives, their health, and the future of their community, all which they say is threatened by corporate greed. What you see on the outside when you pass in front or over the viaduct, it's a different animal on the inside. I mean, they're hot. Uh, a lot of the buildings are old and outdated, and there's just miles and miles of pipe and conduit and conveyors and, and equipment and, and piles of, of either fresh or soured uh, production. And, um, and when you get in the refinery and the starch areas, it's, it's either all white and dusty and, and very uh, explosive, or in some of the areas like the refinery where they do the sweeteners and the syrup, it's uh, sticky and, and extremely hot. The plant at Decatur today is a chemical plant. Dave said it best of all, it's a chemical plant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we didn't have the chemicals out there we had today. They use it today to speed up the process, you know, and there's a, there's a, there's 
caustic, there's sulfuric acid, there's ethylene oxide, propylene oxide, there's chlorine. It's a chemical plant. Chemical and plant. people have to be schooled and educated as to how to handle those chemicals. It's, it could blow up the whole end of town out there. In 1988, A.E. Staley of Decatur was bought by Tate & Lyle, the largest sweetener conglomerate in the world. Based in London, England, Tate & Lyle has acquired other sweetener companies around the world, including its best-known brand, Domino Sugar. Tate & Lyle implemented harsh labor policies and ignored environmental regulations in its new facilities, thus reaping additional profits. It also quickly amassed record fines from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and from the Environmental Protection Agency. One-third of Tate & Lyle's $400 million in profit in 1991 was from its Staley subsidiary. In 1988, Tate & Lyle took over 19 and immediately started uh, ignoring the contract and, and not what we thought they were going to be as far as a parent company. Uh, Staley management began to take a different focus on how they treated and worked with employees. Safety and health is one of the things that started to deteriorate as well. In 1990, Staley's deteriorating safety conditions cost Jim Beals his life. Beals was killed when toxic propylene oxide gas was released into the cornstarch processing tank in which he and Jerry Sumner were making repairs. Larry Shook was the safety man on the job. Jim had just written a, a grievance on about the handling of the propylene oxide in the plant. He had been to the but, union uh, hall that afternoon right. telling them and wrote a safety observation that somebody was going to get seriously hurt with these chemicals that afternoon. He wrote her, it's on file. It's on file. That, uh, you know, the handling of the propylene oxide, unqualified people, according to OSHA, there's supposed to be the minimum amount of people, you know, qualified to do this so that, you know, don't overlap. You need a qualified person to do it. And uh, there's only explosive. like, it was pipe fitters and one supposed to work around this propylene as far as the handling of it, and they've been violating this. They think more of production than they do life right now. Mm -hmm. Because never, in as long as I was over there, and I was in that area longer than anyone, did they ever run both reactors, one reactor without the other, without shutting it down. You I got down into the vessel, and uh, Jim Bills followed me in. So we were in there, I don't know, we'd been in there maybe 10 minutes. And me and Jim see some water, looked like water, coming down from one of the holes in the top of this vessel. We hauled her at Larry, hey, they, they're pumping something in on us. And I was in there maybe, maybe 10, 15 seconds before I was suffocating. And uh, by this time, it was really pouring in, you know. At first, it looked like a shower head around the outside of this pipe. And it was coming in, we knew it was P.O. And uh, I told Jim, I'm getting so-and-so out of here. And he says, but that's P.O. I remember closing my eyes and, and holding my breath and grabbing hold of one of the arms, thinking, well, maybe I can slide along the bottom, because I was suffocating prayer, you know, and this, it was just that fast. It takes the oxygen out of the air that quick. That's what it does. So uh, I remember sliding towards the opening, and I, I was out of it. Uh, I remember going towards a light, you know, but I had my eyes closed, so I, they told me it was probably a lack of oxygen. Made you see the light they were always talking about. I remember, the next thing I remember, I had my head outside the vessel, and I couldn't breathe. I got out, and I was on fire. I mean, all the soft, all the areas on you, you had your soft skin was just burning. My face on fire from this PO. We was thinking, man, we got to do something. <clears throat> well, Jerry's yelling at Jim when he comes out of there. He's soaked with it now. Can you imagine? Knowing that it's that it's carcinogenic to you if you get it on you, he's covered with it. He Scott wasn't getting that one. Was not working. Okay. Yeah. They had 15 Scott Air Packs in the plant, and not one of them in the whole plant was charged over 30 percent. They were all useless. Outside this room, there's emergency oxygen, 10 bottles of oxygen along the wall. They were all empty. There was a colony nothing. of air. They, nothing that they had for our safety worked. They had oxygen bottles downstairs outside and had a tube, uh, not a tube, uh, plastic rubber, bottle, hose. rubber hose that run from outside up to this vessel, to these vessels. And you're supposed to be able to go out there and turn them on. Nothing worked. I, I can remember trying to go back in the hole and, and above this hole there was I-beam supports, okay? And, and the, the I-beam, probably 12-inch I-beam, 
and all these gases were trapping up there. It was 175 degrees. And I do remember I had my head back in there. I do remember seeing Jim sitting there, and he hadn't even moved. I remember seeing his shirt and, you know, hollering and screaming at him. But he, he didn't even move. He was still in the same position. You know, the company was completely in wrong doing this. It's, it's getting back the way it was. It's probably worse than it was right after the accident. It's a public relations thing to let the community know that they're really doing something about it. But the truth of it is, it's completely opposite of that. The safety at the A.E. Staley Company is hard hat and safety glasses and banners at the gate. And no, uh, despite what Larry Pillard says, safety is not a reality in a plant. And I think that can be uh, best depicted by the fact that we no longer have a full-time safety trainers from the union. We no longer have a full-time safety chairman for the union. And there's only really two people left in the safety department with very little experience in the plant. They don't, they don't care. They really don't even care uh, about their com com company people either. They got company people. Uh, they got in engineers. There's this lady, she's 26 years old. She's going to be running a supervisory job in the dry, dry starts area, she's an engineer. She has no idea what's even going on. She's just there, you know? It's like, you know, what, what's gonna happen if some, somebody gets hurt or injured or something? She has no idea what's going on. She won't even know what, what, what floor. If someone says uh, the dryers are down, she won't even know where to go. And drums weren't labeled, and the operator had told me to go upstairs and dip so many canfuls of this liquid in this drum up there and dump it in this tank next to it. So the liquid was towards the bottom of this 55-gallon drum that I had to take the lid off and dip. I had to get my body down in there to get it, the liquid. So I got it on my hands and my arms, but I didn't know what it was. So I dumped it, did what he told me to do, and about a half hour later, I started getting sick. I had stomach cramps real bad, and I was sick to my stomach. So I went down to first aid, and they said, well, you must be having a touch of the flu or something. So when I came back, and it, did, it got worse, so I went home. I only had a couple hours left at work, but I couldn't. I was just too sick, so I went home. And when I came back to work that night, I found out that in that drum was rat poison. It was rat poison. I had it all over my arms and all over my hands. I guess I, my skin absorbed it. That's why I was sick. As far as the uh, safety issues, uh, my own personal experience with it was with the chlorine leak they had here about a week or so ago. Our supervisor was warned that there was a chlorine leak, and he took it upon himself not to inform the rest of the building. So no one knew about it until it was over with. And I found out later on that the chlorine is very dangerous. You can die from it. But they sent me back into maintenance. Okay, this is about in August after the May accident. I'd been a year and four months later. They sent me over to the reactor room to check on one of these seals. Okay, we go up to the door, the big door on there says, check with your foreman for the SOP, the standing operating proceeding for, before you enter this room, okay? We call the supervisor. He don't even know what I'm talking about. He has no idea. It's amazing that, you know, after somebody lo loses their life and they, do they still don't, you know, have a standard operating procedure for doing work on something like that. It's a, it's, it's a sad thing that the people of the community have only the media to understand what's going on. It's awful bias. They tell one side of the story and as far as any of the workers, we never, you know, we just go do our job. And better attitude on safety. If you stand up, they're going to try to take you down. Iraq had a bunch of black, scummy goo all over it, you know. They didn't know what it was, had no idea what it was. And the guys told me to clean it up. And I said, do you know what this is? He says, no, I don't think I know what it is. I said, well, it's, it's an unknown stuff. Since we have to find out what it is before I can clean, clean it up, he says, I think it'll be all right. We just used a scraper and started scraping it up. He didn't have a fa facial on. He was just scraping his stuff up, you know. He had no idea what it was. So I refused, refused to do it. He got mad that I refused to do it. He told me to go back over my job. 
Well, I've come to find out it was a to toxic material that was below 3-0 pH. And because of that, that means it had to be dealt with and had to be disposed of a certain way. And what I was supposed to do was wear a rubber suit with rubber gloves, taped up with a face, face shield and everything else, and rubber boots to clean this up. And I got reprimanded. We had one deal. One of the guys down there that was the operator, <clears throat> Mr. Brazel was the head of the cogen, called him up in his office and was going to give him time off, reprimand him, because we wouldn't hook air, plant air, up to a caustic truck. So the truck is... driver wanted to hook our plant air up. <clears throat> He's supposed to use his own air. Several years ago down there, they had one of the delivery guys come in, hook our plant air up, this caustic the line come loose, out. and it just, I mean, it ate him up. He's blinded. We don't even know if he lived, really. They haven't told us anything, what, but he, his skin was falling off of him when he come in and, into the uh, laboratory downstairs for help. His skin was just, just falling off of him. We do know he's blinded, That's, and they wouldn't tell us what actually happened to him. We don't even know if this man lived. But. You work in different buildings out there. You're exposed to different chemicals and things. And uh, in the boiler room, it has asbestos, lots of asbestos. And then in a building they shut down, 16 billion, a lot of chemicals that cause a cancer. One of the guys I worked with who's like 44 years old over in the boiler room just last December, it might have been November, when he went in for his physical, they found a spot on his lung and it's cancer. They, I went to the hospital, had half my right lung removed. Uh, four or five months later, they uh, cut my benefits. I felt like I had to go back to work. I think the cancer came from Staley's. Uh, what I had was large cell cancer, which is only found in 16% of lung cancer patients. That's pretty rare cancer, so I'm saying it came from what I ingested at Staley's. The conditions I work in, there's asbestos hanging off the walls in the boiler room. That's my basic job is working in the boiler room. There is asbestos everywhere. My other job is working in waste treatment. They use all kinds of chemicals to treat their water with over there. I'm around every bit of that. I've had half my lung removed and they did not take that in consideration whatsoever. Apparently they don't care about me because if they did, they wouldn't have cut my benefits and forced me back into the plant. All we're asking for is a fair contract, something that we can live with. In September 1992, Staley presented its workers with a contract that further undermined worker safety and health. Workers refused to agree to the contract. Staley began to unilaterally implement its conditions. In March 1993, Staley forced its employees to work mandatory rotating 12-hour shifts instead of normal 8-hour workdays. Each shift is from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Staley employees work three 12-hour days in a row, have three days off, three on, three off, and so on, changing shifts every 30 days. This replacement of the regular calendar with a corporate calendar allows Staley to increase its employees' work time 100 hours per year. This means workers never have the same days off each week. In addition to the physical toll on workers, they are always out of sync with their families and the rest of the community. We both had headaches all the time from lack of sleep. <clears throat> um, everything's disturbed. Uh, even to be, you know, very plain about it, even your bodily functions are disturbed. You're tired so you're not as alert. Yeah. Your reaction time slows down. Especially if they ask you to, well, they don't ask, they tell you to report on your day off. In a few days, we're going to be rotating back to days. And that, you just can't, you can't get used to this going from one. And there's three days off that you have with your family. When you work the night shift, the first day when you get off at 6 a.m., you lose that because you're napping all day. The second day, you're still kind of groggy, so you're doing a few things around the house or going to family functions. By the third day, you start to really, you know, you get your, your strength back, you got your sleep, and... and it's to go back. The way they are managing the plant today, or mismanaging the plant, I should say, uh, they have generated a lot of major hazards, both to the employees there and the community at large. The, the ethylene oxide was used in some of the bombs, uh, the cluster bombs in, in Iraq. 
and uh, they were using 40 pounds, approximately to 40 to 70 pounds in the cluster bombs, and we we are using 100,000 pounds just in the process. So you can see that the potential there to the community, and this community should be aware of this, and they should be al alarmed. You walk in there, and you don't know if you're gonna uh, blow up or whatever. They don't care what happens to Nancy Hanna. They don't care what happens in Decatur. They don't have to see it. They don't have to hear it. All they do is give the orders. You do this. If you don't do it, I'll get somebody else to do it. I don't know whether they think about us as being uh, human beings, and it don't make no difference. What we have to sacrifice to get them more money, that's what they want. Everybody was infuriated with this management that was uh, kicking, uh, kicking us around and treating you like a dog and, and showing you I'm the boss and you're nothing and this is the way it's going to be. The company tried and, and, and hoped that they could intimidate us enough to get mad enough to lose our cool and to strike. It was clear had we chose to strike, we would have been starved into submission very quick. These multinationals use all of these uh, financial uh, backers and all these fancy law firms and all of these things with these big heavy haters to come at you from every angle. Workers are fighting not just Staley Company, but a powerful web of corporate alliances. Staley's parent company, Tate & Lyle, may be in England, but Staley has a powerful domestic ally in its assault on its workers. That ally is Decatur neighbor Archer Daniels Midland, an $8.5 billion agribusiness giant. ADM is supposedly a competitor of Staley, but through a British subsidiary, ADM actually owns a controlling interest in Tate & Lyle. Thus, ADM stands to benefit from the defeat of Staley workers, not only because such a defeat would set the tone for labor relations in Decatur, but because ADM stands to benefit directly from Tate & Lyle's profiteering. Acting on this tangled alliance, ADM built a pipeline in Decatur between its plant and Staley's, to provide product to Staley in the event of a strike or lockout. ADM is pursuing labor policies similar to those now demanded of Staley workers, including 12-hour shifts. ADM has also left a trail of federal violations on safety and health and violations of antitrust. For example, in 1978, ADM was convicted of conspiring to fix prices on foodstuffs sold to the Food for Peace program. The company is also a heavy polluter releasing 1.9 million pounds of toxic substances into Decatur's air, water, and soil each year. At the head of ADM is Dwayne Andreas, a powerful political operator in both the Republican and Democratic parties. ADM was the largest contributor of so-called soft money to both political parties in the last presidential election, making Andreas one of the country's most powerful political figures. Connecting this web of corporate spiders is the insurance empire State Farm Mutual, based in Bloomington, Illinois. State Farm is the largest bond and stockholder in ADM. It is also the largest bondholder in other anti-union companies, including Caterpillar. The corporations and the financial institutions have joined their economic and political power to fight workers and to fight their unions. So basically, what we're saying to uh, workers and the unions and other sympathizers, it's our solidarity versus theirs. They have a coalition of power. To meet that power head on, we have to build coalition strength and take them on. Continue to get the, the public uh, opinion and sympathies, and we worked with the clergies and the community and got the churches involved and, and got more strength from the spouses and family involved, and, and we've just grown it. What we have now is over 200 people on an average coming in and as a body on the floor making this pretty strong decisions on what we do inside the plant, outside the plant. You can't fight just strictly from the outside. You gotta fight from inside and outside. For the mo better part of those nine months, uh, the workers engaged in one of the most creative and ultimately empowering activities uh, I've seen in years. We have safety stand down, safety confrontations with security. Safety. I work to rule. I work to rule. You do what you're told to do, and that's all. Uh, what makes it tough for the uh, company is their average uh, supervisor has less than three years seniority in that plant. I have 25 years on the same job. 
and they're going to tell me how to run my job. We are just letting them know they need us to run that plant. This is the most solid group of people I've ever seen in my life. They do things, they do it as a whole. It's almost like a school of fish. <laughs> One turns, they all turn. And you membership and took direction and you took control and I applaud you for it. Hundreds of allied industrial workers, their family members and friends converged at that address to protest in front of A.E. Staley's manufacturing headquarters. The grain processing company locked out its hourly workers Sunday. Staley's executive vice president says the union's in-plant work strategy has made a return to normal operations impossible. Who locked you out? Well, as far as I'm concerned, Staley, Tate Lyle, Domino Sugar locked you out. It's all one and the same thing. There's no question, again, that ADM and Tate Lyle are much one and the same. There's another thing there, percent of ownership in Decatur. How much of Decatur does ADM and Dwayne Andreas own? And by that, I don't just mean fiscal property. How much of the politicians does it own? Okay, how much of the community and business leaders does it own? All of it. Okay, how much direction is this company and Dwayne Andrews given to both bust the unions so that Decatur really becomes a 21st century company town where they prey on the workers and they prey on the environment? <laughs> the State Farm has a controlling interest in Archie Daniels Midland. And if I, in the State Farm wanted ADM and Dwayne Andrews <laughs> to do something, they have the power to force them to do it. Help Staley workers win this fight. Boycott Domino Sugar. Don't buy State Farm Insurance. And send a contribution today to help see the union on to victory. Send your contributions to AIW Local 837, 2882 North Deneen, Decatur, Illinois, 62526. <laughs>
just had a chance to see the uh, film Deadly Corn, uh, produced by Labor Vision, about the lockout of the workers at the A.E. Staley Company in Decatur, Illinois. That film, Roland, is probably uh, a year old, at least. Huh? Yeah, I think at least a year old. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, the situation uh, in Decatur continues. Mm -hmm. uh, I think since the making of this video, Decatur has, uh, the, the, the explosion in Decatur has, uh, has gotten bigger by virtue of the strike at uh, Firestone, Bridgestone Firestone, mm -hmm. right. by the Rubber Workers Union, and the unfair mm -hmm. labor practice strike that's going on throughout the Midwest uh, uh, by the UAW against Caterpillar. Right. Both of those have uh, um, plants there in Decatur, Illinois, mm -hmm. and so we've now got three unions, uh, workers who work for three very large multinational corporations who are out on the streets either by lockout or strike. Um, now, when you were there, Roland, were all three of these uh, unions out together, and was there uh, some sort of coalition work going on between them? Well, there is some coalition work. I, I'm not, uh, <clears throat> I didn't spend that much time out there, and I met some of the folks from Caterpillar and some from, uh, uh, from the uh, rubber workers. Uh, hopefully, they're working together and will continue to do so, even though the three uh, uh, problems out there are different because one's a lockout by the company, one is an unfair labor practice charge and a strike uh, at Caterpillar, and the other one is uh, an economic strike. Uh, the problems are all the same. Mm -hmm. yeah, the problems uh, originate around the greed of these large companies. And uh, they, uh, labor has to work together in order to offset this greed that's taken mm -hmm. over this country. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, one of the lessons that's uh, being learned very uh, painfully in Decatur is that uh, large multinational corporations have a heck of a lot of power in this society. Mm -hmm. um, this doesn't come as a great shock to a lot of people, but it's sometimes it's very evident. And uh, the, right. you know, the power when it is unleashed and when it gets uh, brutal uh, is, is a very scary thing. Now, in Decatur, uh, there have been and I don't even know the exact number, but between the uh, workers in those three uh, plants, there's uh, you know more than a thousand, maybe it's two thousand, thousands, people, thousands of uh, workers who are who are out on the streets, whose jobs are at risk uh, because not because of their actions, but because of the corporations right. and because of what the corporations are trying to do, as far as breaking their unions and demanding uh, concessions and demanding that either people work on. The corporations' terms, there's no such thing as coming together mm -hmm. uh, to agree on what our conditions are going to be. It's uh, my way or the highway, as they put it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have uh, an opportunity to look at another little video that was made back in uh, June of this year, uh, June 25th, I believe, of 1994. Uh, there was a large uh, a rally, uh, march uh, in Decatur that brought together people from around the Midwest who recognized that something uh, very important was happening in Decatur, Illinois, that it was, uh, uh, you know, three large multinational corporations who were acting together to try to defeat labor, and they were being joined by uh, the power structure. Um, people are not used to seeing this on television. Uh, it is, this has not been broadcast on main television before, to my knowledge. Uh, only here in, you know, Labor's own uh, show through public access television do we have the opportunity to, to share this news uh, and this story with, with people here in Maine. Um, but the, uh, the video that we're about to take a look at uh, is focuses on the uh, efforts of all of those workers in Decatur together, not just the workers either, but members of the community, in particular uh, members of the clergy who have sort of rallied behind the workers thinking uh, quite rightly, that this is an issue of social justice um, and that there's a very uh, disproportionate balance of power that's being used against workers. And they came together in uh, solidarity back in June of this year. And this, uh, this video is called uh, Struggle in the Heartland, uh, and it depicts uh, rather graphically in some uh, instances what has, uh, what's going on in Decatur, Illinois. This happened in June. But, uh, folks, the situation is still the same uh, today at the end of December 1994. So let's uh, take a look now at the video Struggle in the Heartland produced by Labor Vision. This is Decatur, Illinois, 1994.
In Decatur, Illinois, the heart of the Midwest, 760 workers and their families have struggled against corporate greed for over two years. They have stood up to A.E. Staley, a division of the transnational sweetener conglomerate Tate & Lyle, based in London. Workers are fighting to protect basic rights of workplace safety, job security, the eight-hour day, dignity on the job, and the welfare of their community. In June 1993, they were locked out for refusing to surrender these rights to Staley. Since that time, they have strengthened their ranks by forming alliances with other workers, clergy, and community groups. In the course of their struggle over the past year, they have found their basic rights to protest threatened. Conservative political forces in Decatur, the state of Illinois, and the U.S. government have placed themselves on the side of corporate greed. Decatur police regularly wear riot gear to picket lines in order to intimidate workers who are peacefully demonstrating. Despite this intimidation, the Staley workers are determined to win their struggle. On June 4th, supporters of the union from across the Midwest came to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience at Staley's West Gate. I came here because I can see only one way out for working people to stick together and to fight for their right because nobody else seems to do it for them. The politicians are not doing it and even some of our top labor leaders are a little bit queasy about it. So those of us who went through similar experience in our younger days organizing, in my case, shoe workers, have learned that only workers understand the struggle of other workers. That's why we're here. There are a number of us, and if we have to be arrested because we feel that justice requires it, so be it. If I get arrested here, which I expect to, if the not going to allow us to go closer to the plant, it'll be my 28th time since 1930, because of those days, I was very active in the unemployed movement. And then during the war, I was arrested during the Vietnam War. The only results that we ever got was from solidarity and the labor movement really solidly backing those who went out on strike or whatever. And we're hoping that this will encourage other unions and the labor movement generally uh, to really start becoming militant because without struggle, they'll, they'll get no place. I've learned that in 50 years of experience. Uh, this is a classic case of union busting uh, by a multinational corporation uh, preying victim on a, on a small group of workers in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, and what relationship do you see between church's role and the labor issues? Yeah, well, this is where Jesus is. I mean, Jesus isn't in a stained glass window or in a crystal cathedral. Jesus is walking a picket line with those who are suffering. That's the way he lived when he was here on earth, and that's where his spirit abides now. So if I want to follow Jesus, this is where I need to be. Well, I think it's a moral issue, a question of justice. The Staley workers have been locked out for a year, and I think in a year's lockout is a very unjust. There's no um, collective bargaining, which is also unjust. If, if the workers don't win, what, what do you think the impact on the community will be? It'll be horrible. Yeah, it's simply going to be horrible. You know, we're cutting off our nose to spite our face, that the whole community will be affected. This struggle here is probably the cutting edge of the labor struggle in this whole part of the Midwest. What happens here will affect not only what occurs in the industrial sector and labor relations, but it will affect public sector and the education sector as well. So I'm concerned that we draw the line here in Decatur.
justice for workers everywhere, and I'm so proud of what those people out there in the line are doing. On June 25th, 1994, on the anniversary of the lockout, over 5,000 workers came to show their support. Hundreds came prepared to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience. They were met by over 180 Decatur and Illinois State Police, most of them out of view of these cameras. Having been pumped up for confrontation less than an hour before, the possibility of violence by the police was in the air. When one worker allegedly brushed against police lines, the police overreacted.
they just started spraying. I was getting ready to sit down and they started spraying. I couldn't breathe, I still can't see. Incapacitation, that's what they're trying to do with the union voice in this country. No, it was wrong. I have something to tell my students when I get back to school. Did you do something to provoke them? I did nothing to provoke them. I was sitting there and I got sprayed directly in the, my eyes. Well, we were just standing on the line and uh, the police, I guess, felt it was too close to them and they started pushing with the sticks. And uh, one, one of them pushed at me and I just put my hand up like that and before I, before I could tell anything, another one, a big guy, leaned over with the uh, mace and shot me right in the face, in fact, almost directly in the eyes from less than a foot away. I'm here to support my union. I've been a member of this local for 20 years, and I'm not leaving. What do you think the police are doing here? Making absolute fools of themselves, showing that they're bought up by this town and this company. Are you prepared to get mace today if they do anything to you? I wasn't prepared for it, but I lived through it. I guess I can live through it again. You did get sprayed earlier? Yes, I did. What did it feel like? Like I was on fire. I've been through it before. I was in the service. I'm a vet. Locked out vet. They got a lot of appreciation, don't they? So what, what, how long were you in the service? When were you in the service? Vietnam era. So you're a Vietnam vet? Yes, ma'am. Ethan, what do you think of what the police are doing here? Only their job. Whatever corporate greed tell them to do, that's what they're doing. And I was just standing there, and I, and I fell over. I tripped over someone behind me, and I fell over. And someone grabbed my arm and, and sprayed the, the sprayed stuff on, her arm on my arm her face. and into my face and into my eyes. After you fell down? After I fell down. Sprayed mace to my children, to my family, and we were not being violent. We was executing our right as a citizen to protest the atrocities the Staley's had put on the working people when they came. How do you feel about the Taylor Police Department now? I feel that they're being run by the city council, and I think that the city council is being run by ADM and Staley's. That's exactly what I feel. It's been nonviolent. It's been stressed to be nonviolent. We only want to show everybody that we're working people and we're human beings and citizens of this country, and we have as much right as anybody else to a good-paying job. And they take those jobs away from us, we have a right to demonstrate as such. Who turned this into a violent confrontation? The police did, right on the line. I was standing there watching. All right, the thank never, you. The line never moved forward, and the police started knocking them back, and the line stayed the same. This struggle goes back to one brother by the name of James Bales, who came up to a union office almost four years ago. He came up with his hand, a grievance. A grievance, brothers and sisters, that said, hey, I'm getting this these working right. conditions are not safe. You're asking me to do something that is not correct. He asked at that time to have a grievance hearing. Immediately, the company said no. That's right. The unfortunate thing was, Jim went back to his job. About three hours later, his wife showed up with his lunch. He was on overtime to find out that Jim had just been overcome by ethylene oxide. This fight is about another brother that breathed asbestos for many, many years down in Nine Belly. And he finally died because he ended up with asbestosis. This fight is about a brother that was over here in 44 building that was a contractor that was doing his job because it was unsafe on a scaffold that fell to his death. Brothers and sisters, this fight, this standing up to your right of human dignity, Sometimes you have to cross the line. John, get the police. Because if you don't cross it, you're not going to be able to live with yourself. Right. Right. This determination by these workers makes it necessary that every one of us who goes back to our union or church or any organization to talk to them about a unique kind of people in this city who have stood up against the greed of the corporations and we owe them every possible support so go to your union go to your church raise money help them survive the struggle until victory is ours when they win all of us will win victory to the staley workers here's what you can do to help the staley workers First, send a contribution today to one of the several funds the local has established. Send your contributions to UPIU Local 7837, 
2882 North Deneen, Decatur, Illinois, 62526. Second, contact the local union about future plans for nonviolent civil resistance and ask how you can help. Finally, take action against Miller Beer, Domino and GW Sugar, and State Farm Insurance Company. Miller Beer is one of Staley's largest customers. Domino and GW Sugar are leading products of Tate and Lyle PLC, Staley's parent company. And State Farm Insurance is the leading investor in Staley, Tate and Lyle power structure. By taking action against these three targets, we can send a clear message to Staley that we stand with the workers in this struggle. just seen a video production called Struggle in the Heartland, the story of the uh, struggle in Decatur, Illinois, the coalition of unions and clergy uh, against the power of uh, corporations and, uh, and the power structure in Decatur. It's, uh, it's a rather uh, eye-opening story. A lot of people haven't uh, heard about this, certainly haven't seen it on television here in Maine. And um, Roland Sampson, my uh, co-host this evening, has, uh, has been to Decatur. And uh, Roland, any uh, closing comments you'd like to make about well, this? Well, I guess two points I'd like to make uh, uh, reviewing these, these films. One is that uh, uh, labor laws in this country are failing workers. And uh, you've seen some of this when people feel they have to go out and do some nonviolent civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember in this country we have the right to protest and, and protest laws that are unfair, uh, in this case to workers. The second point I guess I'd like to make is uh, we and Jay learned uh, right off that uh, we have to become politically involved in the process in order to make changes in, in, in laws that affect all of us, including workers. Uh, in Jay, we did that. Uh, we, we elected uh, selectmen that are pro, uh, pro worker. Uh, I'm from Jay. I now uh, uh, ran successfully for the state legislature, and I will be looking out for workers, not only union people, but workers' uh, uh, welfare. And that's what needs to happen in Decatur. Uh, it's a bigger city. I mean, uh, Jay's only 5,000 people. Decatur is 30 to 40,000. Uh, it doesn't matter. People in that locality have to take control of, of city government. And I think if uh, working people were in control of city government, you wouldn't have seen these, uh, these uh, nonviolent protesters being sprayed with pepper spray. Mm -hmm. I think that's a shame that that should ever happen at all in this country, especially in a nonviolent situation. Yeah. And that's my, my comments made on what I've seen. Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, your, your election, Roland, is, I think, pretty good evidence of the fact that, you know, people who've gone through, uh, you know, here in Jay, Maine, we went through something very much like what they're going through in Decatur, uh, but people didn't give up. And I don't think people in Decatur are going to give up. We had a chance no. to talk to Dave Watts earlier. These are folks who aren't going away. They've, uh, they understand uh, what, the, uh, what the struggle is, and this is a lifelong commitment I think they've made, just like you've made. But... Uh, there is a way for people to sort of fight back against injustice, and there are a lot of things that people uh, can do, need to do, and uh, one of the major areas, obviously, is to get involved in the political process like uh, Roland Sampson has done. Uh, this, this state, and I would say this country, needs a whole lot more Roland Sampsons, a whole lot more people who are, you know, working people, who care about working people, who are willing to, you know, put themselves out, run for office, to try to participate in uh, in changing laws that are unfair to uh, to community values and to working people right now, that's what the Decatur story I think uh, highlights. Uh, it's unfortunate that this story hasn't been out there uh, very well in the media, but the media is uh, is big business, and big right. business is uh, obviously calling the shots in Decatur. Uh, we're trying to break through that here as best we can with Kavanaugh's Corner. 
Uh, if uh, you, any of viewers uh, would like more information about what goes on in Decatur, Illinois, about the plight of the workers at Staley, about that lockout, um, you can certainly uh, contact us here at Cavanaugh's Corner. We have the videos uh, available. We'll be happy to share them with you if you'd like to use this for your you know, community group or your union or your school. Uh, please uh, give us a call at 284-4471. Uh, or drop a note and a postcard to uh, Cavanaugh's Corner at uh, 41 Franklin Street in Biddeford, Maine. That's 04005. We'd uh, certainly always appreciate your comments about our show as well. Roland, thanks again for coming and uh, co-hosting this uh, show. I uh, hope our viewers found this to be uh, uh, educational and uh, on some levels uh, inspirational. Thanks again and good night. <laughs>